book of St. Luke, chapter 15, verse 11. Find these words, and he said, A certain man had uh, two sons. You may be seated. These two sons. elder son who stayed home, the younger son who left two sons. This text, you know the story, it's called the prodigal son because he is the focus of the text. Everything in the text revolves around him. And actually, in order to understand this text, which begins in verse 11 and ends in verse 32, you have to understand it in three phases. The first phase deals with the actions of the immature son. He has selfish motives. He is impulsive in his decisions and wasteful in his actions. He is the immature son. And then secondly, we see the response of the father to the action of the immature son. The father is generous in his giving. He is consistent in his love and patient in his waiting. I wonder is there anybody here who will admit that even in your moments of immaturity, when you made bad decisions and wrong choices, that the father was still there. Loving you, waiting for you, hoping that one day you're going to get it together. There is, first of all, the actions of the immature son. Secondly, the response of the father. But then thirdly, you see the reaction of the elder brother, the one who is supposed to be mature. His problem, though, is that he is self-centered in his focus. He thinks everything ought to revolve around him. Not only is he self-centered in his focus, but he is self-righteous in his demeanor. He thinks because he made one right choice, that he's better than the one who made the wrong decision. Can I talk? And then he is short-sighted in his outlook. All he is concerned about is what's happening right now. Look at somebody and say, does that sound like anybody you know? Come on, come on, just look at your neighbor real quickly, if you don't mind. Put a man in your mouth, get real close to them, and, and ask them, does that sound like anybody you know? And in fact, as you read the story, it, it's difficult for us not to see some part of ourselves in the text. Two something. I wonder, could it be that these two sons living in the same house are actually a composite compilation of all that is in each of us? I'm wondering.
wondering if maybe these two sons are actually one son on a different day. Uh, Y'all don't like what I'm saying. I'm wondering, could it be that every one of us has two people living on the inside of us, and if you catch us on the wrong day, some days I'm mature, some days I'm not. Some days I'm right, some days I'm not. Some days I feel like a nut. Some days I don't. I'm wondering if maybe, if just maybe, may, maybe these two sons are actually all of us. What, what do you mean, Bishop? Well, let me see. Let me see. Uh, Paul explains it like this in Romans chapter 7, verse 21. He says, I find then a law. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind. My, my body is resting against my mind. My Good judgment is wrestling against my emotion. I, I'm, I'm locked in a house, but there are two of me. There is the me that I let you see. And there is the me that I keep handcuffed, locked in the room, because if I ever let him out, he go embarrass the whole family. Look at somebody and say, you don't want to see that me. You don't want to, you don't want to see that me. Could it be that these two sons represent two natures? One good, one evil, one right, one wrong, one mature, one immature, one spiritual, the other carnal. And they live in the same house. Somebody say two sons. You know, the, 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 the thing is, it's, it's challenging because... Uh, the you that came to church this morning may not necessarily be the real you. You that got up and showered and got dressed and fixed your hair and put your makeup on and walked through the door, that ain't the you that was cussing folk out Thursday and Friday at work. That's a different you. Yeah. Most of us have the ability to be what the old folk call two-faced. The Bible calls it hypocrisy. It, it's hypocritical. It's, in, in the Greek, it's a word that means a play act which means that all of us know how to play the part at the right time. You take the country you to the family reunion. But the sophisticated you goes to work. The saved and sanctified you comes to church. Y'all ain't going to help me now. But that's not the same you that was breaking it down in the club Friday night. It's a different you. Y'all don't like my teaching. 
One of my daughters sent me a text the other day, and she said, I'm going to be celebrating my birthday next week. And I just sent her a text. I said, don't forget that you're saved and sanctified. Filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to make sure it's the right you to celebrate. Lean over somebody and tell them, oh, I know there is another you. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Somebody say two sons. Two sons, two sons. Ah. And the way you know which is which, here we go. The, the, the younger son, the immature son is, is the one who's talking. Asking for something. I said, he's the one that's talking. And always, sometimes, lean over somebody and say, folk wouldn't know how immature you are if you wouldn't always open your mouth. My grandmother used to tell me a story of a man who had a son who was somewhat dim-witted. He was not as sharp as others, and uh, the father was having company uh, come to the house, and he told his son, said, now, boy, when uh, my company comes, I don't want you to say nothing, because I don't want them to find out how big a fool you are. <laughs> the boy said, yes, sir, daddy, and uh, company came, and, and Ball was sitting in the room, and he, one of the men that were visiting looked at the boy and said, uh, son, what's your name? The boy didn't say a word. The other man looked at him and said, son, how old are you? Looked at him, he didn't say a word. He said, where's your daddy? Where's your mama? The boy looked at him, didn't say a word. Finally, one of the men looked to the other man and said, you know, that's the biggest fool I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> After the company left, grandmama said, the story went like this, said the boy came to his daddy and said, daddy, I didn't say nothing. And they found out anyway. <laughs> Sometimes you open your mouth and say the wrong thing at the wrong time. And then other times, just not saying anything is still the wrong thing. You know immaturity because immaturity is always talking. And when immaturity speaks, it's always asking for something. Can I teach? There's a passage of scripture in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, uh, beginning at verse 15, look at it, verse 15 and 16, it says, the horse leech, the horse leech, the horse leech, the, 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 the leech that leeches on to the horse. Look at somebody and say, you know you got some leeches in your life. The, the, this is how you know, this is how you know folk that are immature, this is how you know folk that are leeches, they're dressed up, but they're leeches. The horse leech has two daughters crying, give, give. Y'all ain't going to like this. Always asking for something. Uh -huh. And then he says, there are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things that say not it is enough. Can I, can I talk for just a minute? Mm-hmm. It, it, it says that the grave is never satisfied, always wants more. And then it says the barren womb is never satisfied. It says the earth that is not filled with water is never satisfied, and the fire never says it is enough. I, 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 I'm, I'm wondering here, is this younger son, this immature son, I, I'm wondering... How much will it take to satisfy? Y'all don't like my teaching. I'm wondering when will you ever be happy and say I've got enough for myself. 
Maybe God gave me what he gave me so I can bless somebody else. How much money does it take to make you happy? How much house do you have to have since it ain't nobody but you? How many cars do you have to have since you can't drive but one at a time? How many clothes do you have to have in the closet? Some of y'all got clothes ranging from size 2 to size 22 in the same closet, hoping that one day you're going to get back to a 2. Maybe you'll never be a 2 again. You ought to take some of, I wish I had somebody, at least the size is 2, 4, 6. You ought to at least be able to give them away. You can't get one leg in that dress no more. Y'all don't like my teaching. The young, the immature son says, I want you to give me more. Look at somebody and say, maybe the reason the Lord hasn't given you more is because he wants you to be satisfied and thankful with what you have. It's not that he minds you having more, but he wants you to understand that when he gives you more, the more that he gives you, it's not for you. Uh, Y'all don't like my teaching. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them, the immature, said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Give me mine. I want what I haven't worked for. Somebody's going to catch that in a minute. I want what I haven't worked for. Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Give me my inheritance. I have spiritual sons and daughters that sometimes are always talking about their inheritance and I said to one of them one day, I said, the only problem I have with this is that in order for the son to get the inheritance, the father has to die. And I ain't going nowhere no time soon. Look at somebody and ask them, how many times have you wanted what you haven't worked for? Yeah, yeah. I know this is not one of those shout messages. Y'all hang with me for a minute. The immature son says, give me the portion of goods that follows to me. And, and, and the second part of that 12th verse blesses me because it says he divided unto them his living. Which means when the younger son asked, both sons received. How many times has God blessed you because of somebody else's prayer? How many times, y'all ain't going to talk to me. How many times have you benefited by somebody else's bad decision? He divided unto them his living. Can I walk you through it? And then, then, then watch this. It says, the younger son wasted what he was given. Isn't it amazing that we rarely appreciate what we don't work for? You buy your child a car. And they won't change the oil. Because they didn't work for it. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. You buy them new clothes and they go out and play in the dirt in new clothes because they didn't work for it. And sometimes, sometimes, sometimes God does not just give us things. Because he knows if I give it to him, 
you won't appreciate it. So I'm going to make you work for it. It's not that I don't want you to have it. But once you get it, I want you to have value attached to the process that gave it to you. Look at somebody and say, I don't want to be one of those spiritual children that just gets everything given to me. And I never work for anything. Some of us, that's why you don't really appreciate salvation. Because somebody told you that salvation was free. And I came to tell you this morning, it ain't free. You just didn't pay for it. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sins hanging on that cross. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the, the price that he paid. All I know is that when I got it, I wish I had somebody, I got it for free, but it wasn't free. Look at somebody and, and say, and because uh, he sacrificed so that I could be saved, I ought to be more careful about how I live. I ought to be more careful about the witness that I portray. I ought to be more careful about how I act just because I didn't pay for it does not mean that it was free. We live our lives like salvation was free because we don't appreciate what we don't work for. Y'all are quiet, but I'm going to keep preaching until you make some noise. The Bible says that he goes into a far country. He's trying to escape accountability. Don't want nobody to tell him what to do with what he has. Doesn't want to be responsible. Don't want nobody to tell him what time to get up and what time to go to bed. Y'all ain't going to help me now. Don't want no responsibility around the house. Don't want no chores. He, he goes into a far country trying to escape accountability. Some things the enemy can't do to you until you get so far away from prayer. Y'all ain't gonna help me now. Some things the enemy can't do to you until you get so far away from covering. Some things the enemy can't do to you. Went into a far country. That's the text. And the Bible says, now comes a mighty famine. He's in a foreign field. He joins himself to a citizen of that country. And he finds himself in the field feeding swine. Here is this boy from good family. Leaves home with an inheritance. Now he's in the field feeding swine. Somebody missed that. I said, he left home with an inheritance. But now he's in the field feeding swine. How many times have you done things that were so beneath you that you knew if father had been there? If he had been watching, if you had been able to hear his voice, he never would have let you be in that field feeding swine. Y'all ain't going to help me now. Yeah, you don't even look like yourself. Don't even act like yourself. You didn't, you weren't raised like this. You, you, you didn't come from this kind of family. But here you are in the field feeding swine. Boy, get so low. But the text says, here's the text. It says that he would have feigned fed himself with the husk that the swine did eat. You don't get it. You don't get it. 
here is Shadabakosi. Is this boy, he has gotten so far away from home that now he envies Paul. He's supposed to be a prince, but now he's envying pig. Child of God, I came to tell two or three of you that you're better than that. Yeah, I came, I came to tell two or three of you. It ain't for everybody, but, but I came to tell two or three of you that 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 the things that you have allowed the enemy to make you do, you're better than that. The places that you have allowed the enemy to make you go, you're better than that. The conversations that you've allowed the enemy to make you consider, you're better than that. The, the thoughts that you've let the enemy put in your mind, look at somebody and say, you're better than that. I know it may be a bad season. I know it may be harsh and hard. I know it may be difficult and dismal. I know you may be tired and weak and weary. But I came to tell somebody on a Sunday morning, you are better than that. Yeah, young lady, you ain't got to have no sugar daddy. God's your father. He, he knows how to take care of you. Uh, you ain't got to have June Bug to pay the rent. Because if he pay the rent sooner or later, he's going to want a key to the house. All right, I'm sorry. Y'all don't like it when I preach holiness. You'll be all right. Lean over to somebody and tell them you're better than that. How many times? How many times? How many times? As the enemy pulled you into a place and you looked around and said, I don't belong here. You looked around and said, this is, this is not me. This ain't the way I was raised. This ain't the way mom and daddy brought me up. This ain't the, this, this, no, 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 no. I'm lean over somebody and just tell them, tell them you're better than that. He feigned to feed himself with the swine or with the husk that the swine did eat. And then the next phrase, it's very interesting in the text. When you read it, in verse 16 it says, And no man gave unto him. Folk will get you to a place. They'll get you out on a limb. And then they won't help you. Y'all don't like good teaching. I said, folk will get you out on a limb by yourself, and then they won't help you. They'll invite you to the party and then not show up themselves. They'll hatch a plan and tell you we ought to do this, we ought to do that, we ought to do this, we ought to do that, and then you find out you're the only one doing it. They'll leave you holding the ball, drop a dime on you, and say you did it all by yourself. Y'all ain't going to talk to me here. These are people that when he had money, he had friends. He went from most popular to not having anybody by his side. And when they, I said, when they got him in the field, no man gave unto him. You better be real careful about friends who are fair weather friends because people will use you and throw you away 
as long as you can help them, as long as you can bless them, as long as you can make them look good, as long as you can make them feel good, they'll spend your money to go to lunch with you. Y'all ain't going to help me now. They'll hang out with you and make you pay the bill. But if you ever run out, those are the same folk that you can't find nowhere. They'll ride in your car, but don't let your car, I wish I had somebody, when your car won't start, they won't show up. Because the world is full of fair weather friends, and you got to be real careful about folk who want to attach themselves to you when you're doing good, looking good, feeling good, smelling good. I wish I had somebody. Because when you run out, the folk that are real friends, be the only ones there. They're the ones that'll sit on the side of the bed with you while you're sick. They're the ones that'll come see about you when you don't have anybody or anything else. No man gave unto him. Most of us have been there with folk Loved you and left you. Used you and discarded you. And then they have the nerve when they need you again to turn right back around and call you. I wish I had one witness. Yeah, yeah made up my mind, and I may not be right, y'all pray for me, but, but I'm not Bill Withers, and I ain't singing, just keep on using me until you use me up. No, 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 no. I'm, I, I'm tired of folk that are leeches. I'm Y'all don't like my teacher. I, I made up in my mind that, that I'm going to devote the rest of my life giving to people who understand the value of the gift. That don't sound Christian to me, Brother Preacher. All right. Maybe you know the Bible better than I do, but try this. Give not that which is holy on the dogs and cast not your pearls before swine. Sometimes God will send a famine just so you can see the quality of people that are around you. Sometimes God will send a famine just so you can see who your friends are. I'm going to get there in just a minute, baby. Sometimes God will send a famine. That sounds good. Hang on with me. Hang with me. Hang with me. Sometimes God will send a famine just to make you appreciate folk that have been there all the time. Because some of y'all got these new friends. Y'all change friends like you change clothes. And I made up my mind, I don't need a whole lot of new friends. I just want some old faithful ones who have been there. I wish I had somebody. Now, I do have room for, for some new ones who will, will replace the old ones that was no good, even though they were in place. All right, I better move on. Look, the scripture says no man gave to him. Folk that he had fed, folk that he had parted with, folk that he had taken care of, folk that he had helped pay their rent, folk that he had paid their light bill, folk that y'all ain't going to talk to me, folk that he had loaned money to, folk that he had given rides to, folk that he had encouraged, folk that he had blessed. When he got in trouble, no man gave to him. I think I will. I don't know who that was, but I think I will, baby. Help me. Next thing that happens in the text, verse 17, I like this. It says, he came to himself. That's an interesting phrase. He 
came to himself. And I wonder how far away from yourself do you have to get that you got to come to yourself. Maybe when he ran away, he wasn't just trying to get away from his father. Maybe he wasn't just trying to get away from his brother and his family. Maybe he was trying to get away from himself. Isn't it amazing that things given to you at the wrong time, bad decisions and wrong choices, can affect you so much that by the time you get to where you're going, you're not even the same person that you used to be. See, 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 here's the issue. Here's the issue. Trouble can change you. If you don't have a strong foundation, trouble can change you. If you don't really know God, trouble can change you. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't know how to pray, trouble can change you. If you don't have faith, trouble can trouble can. There's some folk in here. You're different from the way you used to be. Not because you're not a good person, but some of the stuff you have gone through has changed you. You used to be optimistic, now you're skeptical. Suspicious of everybody because trouble can change you. You used to be generous and giving, but, but now you're stingy as, I, I, I mean, you, you rub that penny, who's on him, Lincoln? You rub that penny until Abe smiles. He looking at you talking about quit rubbing me so hard. <laughs> because trouble can change you. When you go through something real bad, you say, I ain't never going to do this no more. So because I got betrayed, I ain't going to trust nobody. Lean over on your neighbor and say, trouble can change you. This boy came to himself. He came to a place of reflection and recognition that he didn't like what he saw. Tell him your church. Tell him you call him that. He, he, he came. Go ahead. He came to the place where he stops blaming others and takes responsibility for his own he says, nobody has got me in this place but me. And I came to tell somebody, God can put you in the right place and give you the necessary resources, but only you have the power to change you. Look at somebody and say, can't nobody change you but you. Yeah, and, 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 and so... He comes, he comes to himself, watch this, and he comes to a moment of decision. He, he says, I will arise and go to my father. <laughs> but he says, when I go home, I got to go home with the right attitude. Watch this. He not only comes to a moment of decision, but he, 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 he makes a declaration. He says, I have sinned. I messed up. And a whole lot of times, we, we, we come to ourselves, and we want to go back to the benefit, but we don't want to admit I messed up. Look at somebody, just lean on them real quickly and, and tell them, I know these may sound like big words, but there can be no redemption without repentance. Tell somebody on the other side of you. Say, say I, know, I know this may sound uh, real theological, but tell them there can be no redemption 
without repentance. I don't care. I don't care how much you shout and dance and run and jump. At some point, you got to come in here and admit I messed up. I have sinned. father I have sinned then, then watch this watch this he says I'm no longer worthy to be called his son I'm not coming back with a sense of entitlement I'm not I'm not coming back acting like somebody owes me something uh, 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 my last season was my fault but I'm thankful that I didn't die in that season I'm, I would arrive and, uh, and, and go to my father but when I got there I'm not acting like I got it all together I've been through hell and I barely made it out I wish I had I have six people that would take the hand of your neighbor and tell them I've been through hell but thank God I made it out. I, I wish I had. I wish I had somebody that that would admit that your last season almost made you lose your mind. That your last season almost took you out. I dare you to lean over on somebody and tell them I've been through hell, but I made it out. Goes home saying I'm no more worthy. To be called your son. But, but now here's the good news, and I got to get ready to wrap this up. <laughs> Even though he returns with repentance, the father celebrates <laughs> his return. Look at somebody and tell them your next decision is going to make them make, have a party in heaven. I, I dare you to look at somebody and say, your next decision is going to make them have a party in heaven. See, see, because they're not shouting over your new car. They're not shouting over your new house. They're not shouting over your money. But, but, but when you repent and tell God, I'm ready to live for you. I'm ready to serve you. I'm ready. The, the angels are going to start dancing. got to wrap this up. Here's the issue. This is what God said to me. He said, while his opinion of himself and of his value and of his worth had changed, the father's opinion of him had never changed. Y'all ain't going to help me now. He was judging himself from a perspective of loss, but the father was judging him from a perspective of unconditional love. That's what I love about the father. He loves us no matter what we have. He loved us when we were good looking. And then he kept on loving us when there was nothing good to look upon. He loved us when we were right. But he didn't stop loving us when we were wrong. He loved us when we loved him. When we loved ourselves. But when we realized that we had lost the ability to even love ourselves. He kept on Mm. Loving us anyhow. I wish I had five or six folk that would just jump on your feet and shout, he loved me when I was uh, unlovable. He's so good in me when I uh, didn't see good in myself. Lean, I feel like preaching Baptist this morning. Lean over and tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, he loved you just like you are. He loved him in a far country. He loved him in the midst of the famine. He loved him when he was in the wrong field. And he loved him when he was feeding the swine. Y'all ain't gonna help me here. Look at somebody and say, I'm so glad that he still loves me with all of my 
faults, with all of my mistakes, with everything I did that I shouldn't have done, and with the thing that I should have done that I did not do. Tell your neighbor he still loves me. This is what love done. The Bible says that when he came to himself and he made up in his mind that he was going home to the Father. The Father, when he was yet a great way off, his Father saw him, had compassion on him, ran to him, fell on his neck and kissed him. Tell your neighbor that's what love does. When you can't get to him, he'll come to you. When you can't pick yourself up, he'll pick you up. He'll turn you around. He'll place your feet on solid ground. I dare you to grab somebody's hand and say, I'm so glad that he still loves me. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad. Out of all of his mistakes, the father still loves him. I believe, Cheryl, that every day while he was in the famine, while he was in the field, while he was in the far country, I believe every day the father would go look out the window, look out the door. Somebody said, what you looking for, Dad? And he said, I'm just looking. Go back in the room and sit. And the next day when he got up, go back out and look out the window. Look out the door. What you looking for, Dad? I'm just looking. The next day he'd get up. Go look out the window, look out the door. See, somebody in here is looking for something. And you don't have to explain to nobody what it is that you're looking for. All you have to do is keep looking and trusting and believing. And, and one day, I don't know if it was six months, I don't know if it was a year, but one day when the father looked out the window and looked out the door, he saw somebody walking down the dusty road that looked like his son. The Bible says that when he was yet a long way off, he was yet afar off. The father didn't wait for him to get to him. Hallelujah. He came out the door off the porch down the road and met that boy where he was. The Bible says he saw him. He had compassion upon him. The Bible says he fell on his neck and kissed him. Look right here. Aren't you glad that when you weren't where you should have been, that the Father saw you afar off? When you couldn't get to the altar, he brought the altar to you. Hallelujah. He came and had compassion on him. Fell on his neck. Father's happy that his son has come home. But then the scene changes. Mr. Father tells the servants, now I want you to celebrate with me. 
bring him a robe because I'm going to cover him. Give him a ring because I'm going to restore his identity. Put shoes on his feet because he didn't know it, but all this time his steps have been ordered of the Lord. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. Kill the fatted calf. Because we get ready to have a party. Can I tell you that every time we come into the house of the Lord, it ought to be a party. Every time, I wish I had somebody. Every time we come into God's house, if you would understand where God brought you from and what God brought you through, and if you would understand that the person next to you could have been dead, but when he saw you afar off, he came and found you. I wish I had somebody. You, you come in here shouting and dance. Here we go. I'm finished. But Billy, they're shouting and dancing in the house. They're celebrating in the house. The band is playing in the house. But the, oh, the elder brother, the one who's supposed to be mature, he's out in the field text says, I don't have time to read it, but the text says, when he heard the music and the dancing, he called the service and asked what's going on in the house. Isn't it amazing that some folk that don't come to church, when something happened, they'll ask you what happened at church? <laughs> when he heard the music and the dancing, the Bible says that he asked them what's going on in the house, and, and, and the servant said, your brother is home. Y'all are going to help me now. My brother has come, and my father have killed the fatted calf because he had received him safe and sound. It says that he refused to come in. Isn't it amazing that sometimes we won't go into the house because somebody else is there? Y'all don't like my teaching. He was angry and would not go in. Some folk won't come to church because somebody else is there. You're supposed to be mature. You're in the field. You're the one that stayed home. But the real issue is that this boy was self-centered. He ain't never thrown me no party. He was self-righteous. I stayed home when he left. And he was short-sighted. Because when the father, I love this, because the daddy could have stayed in the house and celebrated with the son who came home, but he wanted them both there, so he came out of the house to talk to the boy whose attitude was wrong, and he wouldn't come in. He went out and told him, he said, look, let me tell you something, knucklehead. Let me explain something to you. Your problem is that you are uncaring and unforgiving. And what you don't understand, you in the house, but you don't have my heart. He says, you in the house, but your problem is you don't have my heart. So you're judging my heart, and you think it's all right just because you're in the house. But then he says something to him that blesses me. He says, what you don't understand is that all of this belongs to you. Because as the elder son, the law says you get the inheritance. And you're about to mess up your future focusing on his past. Uh, somebody's going to catch that. You're about to mess up your future focusing on his past. came to talk to three groups of people. I want you to stand. Keep going.
came to talk to somebody who will admit that there have been some ways in which you have been immature, you've made bad decisions, you've made bad choices, you've not done everything right. But you know that God still loves you. In spite of your faults, in spite of your flaws, in spite of your failures, God has invested something in you called love. He has invested something in you called the gift of life. And you're here. You may have backslidden. You may have walked away from what God called you to do. You may have gotten tired and frustrated with church folk. All of us have. I've had times when I got up and said, I don't want to see nobody that look like they're going to church. And then I came right in church and God convicted me because he said, uh, you're judging them for mistreating you. But how many times have you mistreated me? I want to talk to somebody this morning who will admit that, that you just need to come to yourself. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you're backsliding. But you know that God loves you more than you could ever have imagined anybody loving you. His love is unconditional. And you want to show him that you love him. Now come in.